So namaste, welcome to satsang today, tonight. So uh, this evening I wanted to um, talk about something. Uh, everything I'm always talking about is based on my own experience of awakening and the challenges and the successes, what worked and what didn't. And um, one of those things that I'd like to talk about tonight is this quality that we have as uh, seekers as students as as um, aspirants of that awakened state is um, something that's vastly underrated in human beings and um, that's the ability to kind of um, fixate on something to uh, hold on to something uh, to uh, keep a concentration towards something to ultimately um, this becomes became for me an obsession, um, and that's not too strong a word. And I think this is something that's within all of us. This uh, ability to obsess over something, and uh, for me, most of my life was um, obsessing over the wrong things. And it was actually a relief when I found this is what I've wanted to obsess over, and that obsession has not gotten any um, weaker. In fact, it's stronger than it's ever been. So I just wanted to, to bring attention to that because that was something that I didn't really uh, value within myself. And maybe you might be criticizing yourself for that too. Um, maybe you have ideas like I did that I shouldn't be so kind of uh, focused on this. I should be able to let it go more. I should be able to um, have more outside interests to do more, you know, other things apart from spiritual practice and pretty much every, <clears throat> every spare waking moment that I had was either uh, doing some practice or watching something or reading something, all of that. And I'm sure that's no different for you. But there is a reason why we need to do that. And there's a period where um, we might not be so interested in other things in our life. We do what we have to, of course. But we might not be so interested in socializing uh, or, you know, other things, hobbies and interests that we had before. A lot of things seem to fall away along the pathway, some of which come back after we've kind of realize what we're trying to realize some of them don't that obsession that quality of being able to fixate on something to concentrate on it long enough so to concentrate doesn't really mean in this context to really try hard it means to keep it in your awareness to keep bringing it back to um, your central focus or really what's most important to you and to concentrate on something long enough that it comes to fruition, that you actually achieve what you've been trying to do. And if, if we look back at our lives, anything at all that we've achieved, we've done that. And sometimes we're doing the same thing here in Awakening. We're concentrating and uh, we're fixating and we're obsessing. And maybe we're giving ourselves a hard time because of that, I know. I used to do that. And it was only really when I began to see the effect that the awakening was having on other people around me, the positive effect, that I've stopped finally feeling guilty for uh, giving so much time to this and for not just being a normal person that does normal uh, things, whatever they are, I don't know these days, but things I used to do when I thought I was a separate being that just kind of fell away that seemed um, a waste of time. So 
that quality to ability to obsess over something it's underrated and there's a passion there's a fire when you fixate on something energy begins to build within you to achieve that thing and never more so than when we're fixating on what's actually true there is a spiritual power that begins to build the power of the real self within the body and mind when you do this and you might notice it's going on already some kind of quickening is happening for you and there's a sense that it's moving towards some final end point wherever you feel you're at on that journey it might be you know more and more that you can think about only this and less and less you have any interest in anything else and are you really sort of valuing that as a as a quality of yourself there are lots of beings that would like to be at this stage in their evolution but haven't quite developed that concentration yet and yet here you are and of course there's no judgment there or blame they'll be here when they're here but here you already are already kind of fixating on this and if you really look at what that means, it means it has to be re recognized and realized. You have to achieve what you've set out to do. Because the only thing, the only reason that we can fail with that is if we're not yet at that intense focus. And again, not in terms of time. I'm not talking about intensity in terms of I'm going to meditate for 12 hours a day or uh, something I tried to do, which was uh, like read three books at once. I always had three books. I thought if I read three books at the same time, a couple of pages from this one, a couple of pages from that one, that I would wake up three times as quick. Or if I did three times as much meditation as everyone else, I'd wake up three times as fast. And of course, it had the opposite effect. So it wasn't really about um, hard effort. It was, what's the most important thing for me? And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about obsession. The one thing that you just could not handle not achieving. The one thing that would be a major regret if this body came to an end and you hadn't managed to uh, achieve that. And of course, there'll be other things that we want as well as human beings. But just to begin to value this quality that you have, that it is like that for a reason, because everywhere else in your life, maybe apart from satsang and a couple of spiritual friends that you may have that you can talk about this with. Everywhere else in your life, it's reinforcing the illusion that you're a separate being. And it would be easy to get pulled off of the path, and we all have, of course, and come back again. When I first encountered non-duality, it was 10 years before I came back to it just kind of happened across a satsang online. And um, it was a Muji satsang. And I remember thinking at the time that, you know, this guy is talking really weird stuff. I'm not into that stuff. 10 years later, I found my way back and recognized that that was what I was looking for 10 years ago. And numerous times after that, I kind of, I thought I'd quit awakening and, uh, realized that there was no such thing possible as I'm sure you've experienced too and it is that drive that intensity that brings you back to the path or propels you further along it or gives that intensity in your um, kind of focus your and that also most importantly means that it must be fulfilled what you're seeking must be found you must find it like it's not an if. It's not an if you wake up. It's already way past that for you now because you have this burning passion. And that's not anything to be embarrassed about. Because if we're all a little too obsessed and we're all too obsessed together here, then that's uh, nothing to be um, ashamed of. So we need this obsession. We need this fire to kind of, Keep us focused on this. And um, I just wanted to 
to say that because when I first began to uh, understand what awakening actually is compared to what I thought it was, I'd read these descriptions by these beautiful sages that talk about this thought-free place, effortless abidance, uh, living in and as the thought-free self, where the mind has gone silent and um, you can't really believe a thought at all. And there's constant effortless peace and abundance and all those things that we've kind of come to recognize as being uh, a condition of the awakened state. And it seemed an impossible place. I was reading these descriptions, listening to people talk about it. I read everything I could about what it was actually like. And as I was reading this, taking this all in, my mind was just going crazy. <clears throat> and it seemed like I would have to somehow get rid of all of my thoughts. It just seemed like there's no way that that's something I could actually achieve. That they'd done something superhuman somehow. How do I go from crazy mind that's just obsessively talking about everything and anything and making stuff up even to talk about and bringing up old memories and rehashing conversations I had 10 years ago and then rehash going over the same conversation I was going to have when I got to the next place I was going and all of that. How do you go from that to a silent mind and just shining radiance and peace? Is it about, <clears throat> is it about effort, struggle, or throwing enough work at it? Or is there something else that we can, is there a shortcut we can use? And I began to investigate this and I began to find that by studying the mind, by looking at the mind, objectively looking at it, instead of pushing it away and blaming it and all the other stuff, wishing it would be quiet. And why is it thinking so much? You know, what is it actually that's propelling all of this thought stream? This began to be the focus of my obsession. Why is my mind thinking so much? Because if I can find that out, then I'm going to find a major key to making it go quiet. Why is it actually thinking? What's the cause of this endless um, stream of noise that's coming. And I began to recognize that thought gets stuck in its own trap. So in my self-inquiry, I was beginning to see that I wasn't really a separate being. I never had been. Couldn't find anything that was me. What I, what I found was something insubstantial, intangible. And that was becoming clearer and clearer that that's always been what I am. And yet this constant stream of talky, talky, talkiness, you know, that goes on, was still carrying on. And I began to recognize that every time I think about something, I am making myself into a separate being again. So if I think about myself, I'm thinking about myself as a separate being. And if I think about someone else, the fact that I'm thinking of them as a separate being means I've automatically turned myself back into a separate being. There was the allness, the one, and then I thought about this person, which leaves me separate from them over here. So even when I'm thinking about someone else, I've separated made myself back into a separate being again without realizing. And my body suffers. And even when I'm thinking about something in the future, I've separated myself from that future. Thinking about it, it's not here yet. It's not here yet. And I'm separate to it. Thinking about something in the past. And the more I investigated this, the more I began to see that... Um, I can't think about anything without taking uh, this idea up again that I am a separate being. Even if uh, he was my 
fear or obsession, thinking about awakening, thinking about the thought-free place, that I was actually separating myself from it and emphasizing that it's separate to me. And this began to uh, become clear that what's driving this thought stream then is I'm trying to get to a place where there's no separation by fulfilling, uh, by um, propelling, by uh, actually emphasizing the separation within me. So I'm trying to get to wholeness, to experience oneness by thinking in separation. And it began to, by understanding why the mind can never get there through thought, there was suddenly this um, tiny little gap that began to develop where I could just not listen to thoughts sometimes. And that gap got wider and wider where it became eventually a choice. Do I listen to this thought or not? First, it doesn't feel like a choice at all. But curiosity about the mind, why is it doing what it does? And can it ever get to where it's trying to go? Is there any way to the self through thought, to the thought-free place through thinking? And thinking about the thought-free place is just going to emphasize the feeling within me that I'm not actually there yet. So what's the remedy for this then? What's the way out of this thought-created challenge that we have going on? I began to see that the only remedy was to uh, focus on what was actually already here, the thought-free place, as much as I could, which we also call meditation. We'll do some of that in a moment, a, a short meditation. And then when thought arises, not to judge it, blame it, or try to resist it, but I can be aware of mind talking, noticing that it's always trying to get to something else. So if I'm thinking about a memory, I, you know, something I experienced 10 years ago, I'm trying to get to a better feeling place inside of me by thinking about it differently, rearranging it in my memory so that I feel better. So where I feel I am now, where I want to, to be, or whatever I'm thinking about, can we begin to not um, reject mind so violently, maybe that's not the way. And it's not never really worked for anyone to push against it. Have you noticed that? That the more you wish it would disappear, the more noisy it gets. And the times when it goes quiet, kind of accidentally, you find yourself in this beautiful place in meditation, accidentally, where mind just stops. And you didn't do anything to get that. You just kind of relax somehow in the meditation and somehow by not controlling the mind, you've kind of lost interest in it because there's this nice thought-free place. It just went quiet. So can we use this obsession, this obsessiveness to fixate on the place that's already here? And can we begin to soften our attitude a little with the mind? And be in more of a meditative stance throughout the rest of our day as well. I don't mean you have to kind of walk around with your eyes closed, but if you're focusing on what's real, the objects appearing in your awareness, so the thoughts appearing, uh, emerging out of the thought-free place will just be other objects, there won't be any difference. You're not upset by the furniture in the room. Why should we be upset by the thoughts floating around in our awareness? There's the thought-free field already. It's silent, it's empty, it's vast. And then there's thoughts, internal objects of thought, emotions, experiences, sensations in the body, external objects 
all the furniture in the room you're sitting in, other people, whatever's in your environment. And as your attention is on what is real, you still notice the objects, they just don't bother you. They just don't have any impact upon you. You can't notice the thought-free space without also being aware of thoughts passing. You can't listen to the silence without hearing the sounds that are arising inside it, coming and going. They're not in conflict then. We're not desperately trying to choose one or the other. Let's do, um, what time are we? Let's take 15 or 20 minutes just to do a quick meditation. We'll do some, um, we haven't done it in a while actually. We'll do some zooming in and zooming out. A fairly easy one to kind of get into. So if you want to leave your eyes open, you can. You might get a deeper sense uh, with your eyes open in this one. It's entirely up to you. And if your eyes are open, I'm just going to start by noticing an object in front of you. Could be your own body, could be some the device that you're watching this on, listening to this on. Noticing any object, a chair, a piece of furniture, anything at all. And we're calling that zooming in. So there's the objects that we zoom, our attention zooms into. And I'm just going to ask you to zoom out and notice the space around that object. So there's an empty space, a nothingness around my body right now, around your body, whatever object you're looking at. We're just zooming out, we're calling that. Noticing a thought-free place. And the objects don't disappear, they just kind of experience in a different way. They're not quite so intrusive. If your eyes are closed, noticing that empty space before any thought arises. And if a thought arises, it's just arising in that space. You can watch it come and go. If your attention goes with the thought for a while, it's okay. You just zoomed in. And you zoom back out to notice the space. So just like this for a few minutes. Whenever you find that you've zoomed in and you're looking at an object, usually a thought, as soon as you recognize, no blaming, no big deal, you just zoom back out, notice the empty space. Just the empty space. You can't see it with your eyes, it's just here, you know it's here. And we're just zooming back out. And we're letting go of the idea that somehow we can stop attention from zooming in. It's just not possible and we don't need to do that. You will zoom in at some point to some thought, some sensation, some emotion, some energy moving. Or your attention will be drawn to something in the room if your eyes are open. And that happens to everyone. It's really okay. Just when you notice, you zoom back out again, bringing attention back. Attention can either focus on something or on nothingness. Just changing one habit for another. We tend to live our entire life zoomed in. And it feels so much nicer just to zoom out. And you can notice <clears throat> your body relaxing as you zoom out. And as you stop beating yourself up for zooming in, it really doesn't matter. It's really okay. So just sitting either with your eyes open or closed, it doesn't matter. And 
anytime you notice you've zoomed in again, just zooming back out, noticing that which has no shape or form, that which is always here, just empty space. It's simply a habit to pay attention to the objects first. And that's just a habit that can be reversed. Allowing yourself to relax and enjoy how it feels just to zoom out. Attention doesn't have to always be so narrowly focused. That's quite taxing on the body. And as we're just zooming out again, it doesn't matter how many times we have to do that. Begin to feel more relaxed. So what if you have to bring your attention back 20, 50 times? It zooms in, you zoom out, no big deal. It's not the goal of this meditation to get to a point where you stay zoomed out. Don't even need to work at that. From time to time, you'll find some thoughts, some emotion, some energy, some external sound. Something will draw your attention, will zoom back in. And just noticing, refocusing on the emptiness, the nothingness. And you might notice yourself just kind of slowing down, some slowing down going on somehow inside. And that even if mind is still talking, it's okay. It's not really impacting in the same way. Mind can just be talking and you're zoomed out. You're watching the space that mind is talking in. <clears throat> Every thought appears inside the nothingness, the emptiness. And then disappears. And this is concentration, this is obsession, this is meditation. And it's not hard work. It's just gently zooming back out when I notice I've zoomed in. Just because it feels nicer to do that. It feels lighter, it feels freer. Just 
just because it's nice to build a habit to focus on <clears throat> the emptiness first. <clears throat> Just noticing if you've zoomed in again. It's going to happen from time to time. A nice state comes upon the body and attention goes to it. Or a negative emotion. It's okay. Meditation be as simple as this. And if ever I feel lost, I can just bring attention to the space around my body and begin again. There's nowhere to get to here. There's just these changing modes of attention. You're just here. Attention is either zoomed in or out. Gently like this, zooming out just becomes the habit. This silent, invisible, Nothingness, not a thing yet -ness. It's all around at all times, always available. We can use the objects, the thoughts, the bodies, the emotions to point us back to this. They don't have to be in conflict. Just take a few moments, a few minutes to enjoy this.
just like this as we zoom out. And we begin to find that we can do this while our eyes are open. And then while we're talking, and then while we're walking. And eventually, anytime we want to, no matter what is going on in our experience, attention just likes to be zoomed out. It's more relaxing, nicer feeling. It's really just a thought that says, you can't be like this while you're working, while you're shopping. This is your natural state. Just zooming back out. If your attention has wandered. Maybe peace is simply a shift of focus like this, not getting rid of anything. So in a few minutes, 
we'll be bringing this meditation to a close. And as we do, as we move back into activity, we can still practice staying zoomed out as much as we want to. My body can move and talk and engage even while my attention is zoomed out. In fact, it may even talk and engage better with my attention zoomed out than fixated on it. So whenever you're ready, whenever you want to, if you want to open your eyes, if they're closed, you can. You don't have to. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I'm going to um, read a question that's been sent in. If anybody has any questions or challenges you'd like to share, I encourage you to uh, raise your hand uh, on Zoom. We'll see how much time we have. So this question says, um, Dear Helen, during meditation, I had the sensation I was standing on a shore wading in the shallow waters of awareness. I wanted to fully immerse myself and dive deeply into the depths, but I felt there was something literally holding me back as a pain appeared in my chest. I began to question, what is it that's holding me back? Then it occurred to me this question is a self-fulfilling prophecy. By asking what's keeping me from the self, I'm claiming that I am a separate being. So now I contemplate, is it really true something is keeping me from awareness from the self? Just by typing this and pausing to meditate, my heart is open and I do feel submerged in all that is. I would love to hear your encouraging words on this. Much gratitude and love. Wow, yeah. How powerful are we that the simple thought, the simple idea that something can keep me from my awareness self, the self, that I immediately experience feeling that thought immediately manifests as a pain in my chest and I feel separate to the self in that moment. I feel lowered in my state. I feel an absence of peace and I feel divided just from that thought. And it is, as you say, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And uh, these, there's quite a whole uh, family of these kind of thoughts. You know, what can I do to get deeper into the self? It's going to immediately make you feel that you're back up on the beach, you know, just splashing around up to your ankles. And noticing that, right, you can uh, begin to just let those ideas go. They were useful for a while, but then you see how immediately you experience what you are convinced of because you are the self already. You're infinitely powerful and you can infinitely experience this one thought. What is it that's holding me back? Well, maybe only that thought, right? It's very exciting, very exciting when I... Um, I'm claiming that I am a separate being by asking what's keeping me from it. And there's the futility of thought, can you see? It seems like a good thing to ask. I used to ask, how do I merge into the self? How do I surrender? How do I give everything up that I need to? And then I realized that that was the issue right there. That was the actual issue. This convinced feeling this absolute certainty that I was not already that. 
was hanging out in this kind of um, assumption. Wonderful. Just noticing those other places that you're doing that to yourself that become more and more obvious and letting them go. And each time you do, you'll just feel, I am the ocean. I am. I've been trying to get into it. But that's part of the dream, isn't it? That's part of the last bit of illusion. That there's something I've got to do to um, somehow get to this ocean, this self, and all of that. Wonderful. Lovely. So if anyone would like to ask a question or share anything, um, feel free to raise your hand. Muriel, whenever you're ready. Hi, hello. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Um, I really want to ask about uh, memory because I'm, I'm getting to understand that there's only ever here and there's only ever now. We can never be anywhere else. Yeah. And yet there's this memory of the past, yeah. memory of things that I shouldn't have done, memory of being a child, memory of an hour ago when I was sitting here having a cup of tea waiting for you. Yeah. Where, if there's no past, then, then what is this about? It seems to... Uh, when we believe we're a body, it seems to be there's a linear progression of time. There was an hour ago and then there's now, and then after satsang is finished, there'll be whatever comes later. But as you begin to see there's only now, this moment, like you are saying, it became clear to me that that now is one long, continuous moment that never ends. It's just been going on forever, and it will go on forever. But at this point, our mind kind of puts a time stamp on this now was more real than the previous uh, time we experienced it. So it divides it into past, present, and future, these arbitrary things. But even when you're thinking about an hour ago before satsang started, you're thinking about it now, aren't you? Mm. And if you think about what's going to come after satsang tonight or whatever time, you're thinking about it now. And she said, you can't get outside of that. It's just that our mind functions based on a sense of duality. So it's always trying to arbitrarily divide things into categories. And it really believes that this thing called past exists. And it looks like that, doesn't it? It looks like our bodies are aging. It looks like we're deepening in our development spiritually and all of that. But it's not a volitional thing so it's just what's happening in the manifestation in this nowness just like a, a flower a rosebud grows and blooms all by itself it doesn't need any pushing to do that does it i don't know yeah. if that kind of gets to what you're talking about or yeah i think my to... mind my mind will struggle with it you know um you don't have to one of the most important things that took me a while to realize was there's always going to be that sense of time. While there's a body there, there'll be a sense of time. It's really time that's born, isn't it? When the body's born, suddenly there's a sense of time, a beginning, and that goes on for as long as it goes on for the body uh, dies when it dies and time stops then. So there's always this timelessness and then there's this sense of time here too. And it's not a mistake, it's a useful thing. Otherwise, how would we know what time to get on satsang or something like that, you know? Mm. But just once you understand it's not really real. So if I'm thinking about something I did 20 years ago that I really regret doing, mm -hmm. but I go back in my uh, imagination to that point 20 years ago, it was happening now. There was a sense of nowness when it happened. And it couldn't be any different than it was when it happened. My action in that moment was how it was. Mind believes in the sense of time. So it says you could have done something differently. You should have done some, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all just unfolding as this now continues. So it's not that it didn't happen. You see, that's yeah. where this whole non-dual thing comes in. Oh, nothing ever happened. 
Um, there's nothing to forgive. Um, but what I'm hearing you saying, it is some kind of a, almost an eternity yeah. of what is unfolding in eternity. Yeah, there's just it's always the, been this rose petal, this, this rose bud, and it's always going to be unfolding. There's never a time when it wasn't, and it's never going to come to an end, and it can infinitely expand its blooming, you know. Manifestation never really started or will end. It's just mind says it takes arbitrary stop points in that unfolding and says this is a beginning and this is an ending and you know it really believes in that. So yeah, I mean it's I understand really a that continuous what need, thing, isn't it? A movement. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. sorry, go ahead. I mean we we could never experience a life if we didn't have a, a beginning and an end. So I do see the purpose of it. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, how would we, if everything was happening all at once, um, it would be just overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and kind of from the perspective of the self, it is happening all at once, but from the perspective of the mind, it's unfolding sequentially. And, and they're not in argument with each other, really, are they? And in fact, without this sense of time and duality and change and growth, would we have ever recognized the self? You know, it's only by the contrast of this time unfolding uh, that we can recognize as something not that where there isn't any time. Yeah. yeah. But it's just it's enough to recognize it's not really real. And that you are the same now as you were 20 years ago. And you're never going to change in that way. The appearance of the body and mind will continue to unfold. The evolution of them, it looks like a deepening. Just to know it's not actually so is enough. It gives you peace then. Mm. And you can actually begin to enjoy the time you've got with the body, not, not mm. sort of fearing an end to it or anything. Thank you. Does that help? Yes, thank you. It's a little crazy, isn't it? Yeah. What do you mean it's all yeah. happening now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. 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 Just, just to gently play with these things that don't, we don't understand immediately just kind of what does that actually mean just curiously you know that's enough to to bring an understanding about mm. lovely and good to talk to you thank you <laughs> uh sophie <coughs> hi helen hi how are you doing hi i'm fine thank you um Could you just be when, like, a, it's hard to put into words, a, uh, a um, greater uh, silence. I'm struggling uh, to hear you there, Sophie. Um, okay. Yeah. Maybe best if you leave your camera off, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes um, it just helps the connection if it's not trying to do video as well. Yeah. So, sorry, carry on. God, that's amazing. I didn't actually stop my camera, but it stopped. I think I, I, that. I might have done it for you just to... Oh, okay. Just, just I thought it was a cosmic power. Oh, no, I'm not that good. <laughs> not, not yet, anyway. I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so when there is that opening that, that appears and, and there's this stopping of, of identification, really... Yeah. Uh, then it, it appears also that there's this uh, that you then that that then there's then this kind of penetration of uh, of another level that arises of contraction, mm -hmm. and it feels like well is is that that could just be another belief that that is is something that is then being encountered. Because then there's, you know, you in this zooming in and out, there's there's the it's still the zoomed inness is is has arisen again, even though there was this um I, I don't know quite what, what I'm trying to convey, but there's a sense of uh maybe none of that, maybe just zoom maybe the zoomed in is another concept of 
I mean, am I really coming across another level of myself that is asking to come home or is that just a seeming thing that's happening that's a belief, if you see what I mean? And I don't even have to, that silence doesn't have to engage in it in that same way. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. not really explaining it well, I but you are you doing you're doing great um every, every time we hang out for a while in the awareness as the awareness or the thought free place or zoomed out as we're calling it whatever you know it it, <clears throat> it has the effect of that stopping as we're saying that relaxation and it also has the effect of allowing more uh life force into the body because all the thoughts we've been believing or it costs us so much energy to be constantly zoomed in, you know, where they're everywhere in us and we're constantly fixated on objects like thoughts and things. So when we stop doing that for a moment, there's this kind of influx of um, life force that comes as a sense of peace and energy and uh, contentment and uh, a well being that kind of builds. And with that, our body relaxes, but it becomes clearer in that where our body is still tense. So certain places might still be holding uh, the residual, some fear or guilt or something like that. And it, it suddenly, what's still inside the system, the energetic system is um, even more out of place than it was before vibrationally because the overall vibration of the body and mind's gone up as that life force comes in higher frequency and more of it. So the kind of slower, lower, older frequencies are, are even more noticeable then by contrast because this energy is trying to move quickly. Uh, you know, energy is supposed to flow and it hits this kind of slower, more resistant energy. Not bad, just slower and more resistant. Some old ideas um, about not being safe, not being good enough, all of that. And you're right, in a way, <clears throat> that's just more zoomed inness. Um, and you know that will resolve itself clearer and easier if I just stay zoomed out as much as I can my body automatically knows what to do with that energy you know when it comes up and my mind will begin to ask uh, automatically ask a contemplation question if I need to you know is this really true or what's this resistance about or whatever all of that can just be going on like there's nobody contemplating, is there? There's just contemplation happening. And that's just the objects. And uh, all of that's going on just fine, isn't it? And then we can stay as much as possible zoomed out. And the contemplation works even better when we're not trying to make it happen. So eventually, you're just more and more zoomed out. And then you notice some resistance and you ask what that's about. And this idea pops up and you go, oh that's not really true. And it's not this kind of hard, arduous process uh, to kind of transcend it. It's just, oh, that's not true, obviously. I didn't know that was in there. I've just seen it and uh, off it goes. And so it's a different, same kind of thing going on. It's just differently handled, isn't it? don't know if that kind of helps. Yes. Yes, it does. And um, good. Yeah. Yeah without going into any further detail about what, because it is extraordinary what, what is contained within the energetic system of, a, of your being, the human part. We've had um, body after body after body, <clears throat> you know, like imagine lifetime after imagine lifetime, believing we're not safe, believing we are this finite limited being that's alone in the world. Mm. And <clears throat> that is so um, untrue, that it, but it seems so real. We experience it in a, such a real way that we can't process the emotion that comes from that idea that I'm not safe, I'm not good enough, until we begin to zoom out. Because this idea that I'm a separate being it is kind of, uh, we, we spend our, I mean, this is an exaggeration, but our whole life kind of like this you know, mm -hmm. trying to watch, you know, for the next thing that's going to go wrong or the next person that's going to attack us verbally or something like that, you know, sort of ready for a, a fight as well. 
And it's only really when we begin to relax and zoom out that the body can, can move this energy and, and begin to really process it. Mm -hmm. And before that point, we might feel it. It might come to the surface, but we don't always have the tools to actually let it go once and for all, to see through the idea that's generating the fear. Mm. So uh, there is a, sometimes more of it comes up when we begin to really access the thought-free place, but it's not um, a sign of failure. It's actually a sign that our body's beginning to relax and energy is beginning to move again. Mm. To get a sense of it. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. There's a lot I of fear stuck in the tissues for me and the energy system, a lot of guilt, unworthiness, a lot of anger too, you know, uh, frustration and all of that. So it's totally normal. It's not pleasant. But for me, then it was experienced as actually finally being healed rather than just coming up, overwhelming my system, flooding it with this fear or whatever, and then disappearing again at some point just to come back in another month or so, whenever it was. Can you feel something different when you're feeling it now, when it's coming up? Yeah, it, it's, as you said, so are you saying that it, there's a sense more that it gets healed rather than just goes back down in order to come yeah. back up again? That it does actually kind of, as they say, sort of get burnt up through that continual yeah. presence. It's naturally being transmuted. It yeah. naturally wants to rise in frequency anyway. But my insistence that I'm a separate being is keeping keeping a lid on it all. Right. You know, so it can't finally and fully heal really until uh, I can't let go of the fear of that comes with the idea that I'm a separate being until I've stopped believing I'm a separate being. Um, and that's why sometimes it seems to come up like how much stuff is there in there? You know, I've been doing this for a while now, but finally from here it can be released once and for all, uh, try, allowed to turn back into peace. That's what peace is really. The collection of all the frequencies I've liberated within me, all these lower energies. And that's why when you, when you really feel something as the self, you immediately feel different afterwards. You feel lighter, you feel freer, there's more peace. Mm. It's just kind of turned back into peace. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, good to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll take uh, Gabrielle and then we'll leave it there for today. Whenever you're ready. Hi, Helen. Hi, how are you doing? All right, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, that was great what Sophie said. It's a really quick question then regarding all the vasanas coming out really strongly. Um, so this is my experience of dealing with it. And now just listening to you, I'm not sure whether I'm re uh whether i'm processing out the system yeah. or keeping it alive so my experience is now it's very different to how it used to be i can so there's uncomfortable in the body i can sit with it it doesn't always come up but if i sit with it long enough it will sometimes come up i'll realize oh god it's a sadness and i'll let the sadness or tears come yeah and it will go or I just stay with it until I, I cry, until mm. I stop crying. Or um, there's been a lot of rage in the last month or so. It's really rooted stuff. I can kind of see where it's from or the pattern it is. Um, so this is about six weeks ago. It was really intense anger. And I got out of bed and I just got some cushions and, you know, really wanted to get in touch with yeah this anger because it's a, an emotion I was very uncomfortable with in the past um and then once it's out I don't really think about it again mm. I don't really question it either I do see the pattern I do see the um I do seem to have an idea of what the whole blob of it is about like it's um it's anger and it's from my dad and it's repressed. It comes up in one big visual kind of thing. Yeah. But so I'm just not sure whether that is a, a good way to process it now or whether I should be doing more investigation. <laughs> well, anybody that says they want to get more in touch with a negative emotion is obviously coming 
more from the self than from ego. Our egoic sense of self uh, is never going to want to feel. In fact, it, it's, it's got some quality avoidance going on there, right? It's like, I don't want to look at that stuff. So the very fact you're saying to me, I really just want to get in touch with this, which is another word for loving it, isn't it? Accepting it more. Yeah. So there's a deeper acceptance of this stuff just needs to come up, as we were saying before. And for me, there was some stuff that no matter how much I did that with, it just kept on coming. So eventually there was this sense of why is it still being generated? If I'm feeling it and feeling it and feeling it, why is it still like, where's the end of it? Yeah. And um, I began to get a sense that there was something in me that was still as fast as I felt it, it was being generated again. Uh, so a lot of fear, as we're saying, anger, rage, like you said, and um, I was getting really good at expressing it without kind of projecting it onto anyone. You know, I didn't kind of want to kill anyone anymore, but it was still, you know, very intense. Um, so eventually I began to see that it needed a little more investigation with some emotions than others. And you'll intuitively know, you'll know, even as you're asking this question, you'll have a sense of this is going to go if I just keep doing this, or this isn't really diminishing in its intensity each time it comes up, or it might even be getting more intense, you know, yeah. as, as your awakening has deepened. I'm just plugging my sleeve in as I talk to you. Yeah. My computer's crashing. Hang on. Don't want to lose you. Uh, so can you get a sense of whether it's getting more intense or less? Um, I think. Oh, Helen, can I just put the switch on one sec? Sorry about that. Um, no worries. I think it's a lot less than it used to be. When I when that awakening happened uh, about four years ago, I mean, I couldn't get out of bed for about two years almost. I did function, but it was really hard to function yeah. um, because the level of stuff that hadn't been processed was so intense well that doesn't happen at all life's quite light now yeah. but the body I, I do feel the tension inside a lot hmm. um so I'm happy to say it has got a lot 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 less but I think this, this is why I'm asking I think this residue there's something I'm either not willing to see or to question there's, there's fear it seemed like there was fear at the root of it all it just usually there is at the, the root of anger there's some kind of fear isn't there underneath yeah anger is yeah. kind of i want to do i feel powerless i want to do something to kind of yeah. change yeah and, and that's okay but um so you know just to recognize there might be something i don't want to see i can begin yeah. to gain what, what is it that i haven't wanted to see before or maybe you couldn't yeah. Now, you know, maybe you couldn't really get in touch with it. And um, usually it comes down to either fear or unworthiness in, in my experience and, you know, helping other beings. Yeah. Do something like that. And, and they're very closely linked together. If it I'm not feels both of those are yeah. true. Yeah. Deep, um, deep unworthiness and self hatred. There was a real deep self hatred that came up yeah. uh, a few years ago, but it, I can still see it there, residues of it. So just, you know, for me, um, these things were going, they were lessening intensity. Some of them I needed to investigate because they were building intensity. Some were going, it was just like, do I still want to be doing this in three years? You know, so. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Yeah. Like, how long have I got to sit with these frigging, uh, you know, that comes up sometimes. Yeah. God, is there more inside? <laughs> that's when I started contemplating, looking at the idea behind the emotion. So what would... Um, what would fear say to you if it could talk to you directly? What would guilt or unworthiness say to you? And is that true? You can turn that then into a question. It's usually an I statement. I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. Um, all these ideas seem very, very real. And we've experienced them over and over again as a separate being. But now as the self, is this still true? Am I going to? And just sitting with that as a question, is this true actually? Because if we're not questioning it, we're going to experience it. And hence this emotion just keeps coming and coming. You'll intuitively know if you need to question or contemplate on some emotion. You'll feel it, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, no, that part because there's a thought when I when I'm speaking now to you, there's still a part of me that wants to bash it over the head and get rid of it. Yeah, uh, of course that's not going to make it go away. Um, okay. There's also the self, you know, not so much of the ego saying, "All right, I need to get rid of this emotion. I'm going to bash it over the head," and you know, more it's the self of the self's kind of saying. It would be nicer if this was a higher frequency. It'd be nicer for my body. It'd be nicer for yeah. myself. There's nothing wrong with this fear, but it'd be nice if it was healed. You know, some yeah. kind of loving thing. It'd be nicer for the fear, even if it was transmuted back into peace, wouldn't it? It'd be nicer for your body. It'd be nicer for you. It's more of a loving reason for wanting to release it rather than sort of egos, you know, you know, yeah, what we yeah, used to do, yeah. like, I don't want that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That helps. Thank you. It's everybody's question, I'm sure. So yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. It's <clears throat> a good place to uh, to leave it for this evening. Thank you very much. Namaste. Namaste.